Great, so um, thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation. The title of my talk you see before you is Memory in Fragments, Layers, and Sound, Tracing the History of Bamana Karta into the Global 18th Century. <clears throat> so I'll begin by quoting uh, Mande uh, Bard, Jelly Mamari Kuyate, who says, the world is like a long warp thread in a loom with not enough woof thread to make a whole cloth. Jelly Mamari Kuyate inserted this Bamana proverb into the mouths of two small birds arguing about the relative virtues of boastfulness or humility. Those birds buzz the ears of a horse ridden by Soro Silamakan Koita, who commanded a large cavalry of thousands in the, board, in the Sahelian border town of Nyoro during the 15th century. Blind from birth, with legs permanently scarred by fire as a child, Kuyote belonged to a highly regarded lineage of Mande Bards. His story of the birds and Soro Silamakan was actually a digression from his main topic an epic account of Sansan Koulibaly, who was an important forebear of what became the Bamana state of Karta during the 18th century in what is today Western Mali. The digression had seamlessly woven Karta into a discursive historical landscape of Sahelian political economy that went back centuries. As with many uh, oral traditions of the Sahel, Kuyote communicated knowledge in several ways, moving effortlessly between disparate historical periods throughout his rhythmic and percussive narration of Karta's origins. Parts of the region he described had been subsumed by the successive empires of ancient Ghana, Wagadu, Mali, and Songhai, uh, covering a period stretching roughly from the 8th to the 17th centuries. From the late 17th century, oral and written sources convey the emergence of the Koulibaly clan as political rulers of both Segu and Karta until 1855, when full bay armies of El Haj Umar conquered the Masasi Koulibaly at Nuro, a town in the northern um, Sahel. In 1860, those same armies conquered or, or took control of Segu, the Bamana capital on the Niger River. Um, rather than a linear chronological account, bardic accounts embed discrete mentions of notable individuals and significant events that appear as fragments of information and layers of historical discourse that require careful attention to be fully appreciated. In the 1970s, Scholars began to more systematically record, transcribe, and interpret a variety of Mandan or, uh, oral traditions across a wide region from Segu to coastal Gambia, and from northeastern Guinea all the way across to northern Ghana. And I think we often um, forget the sort of immense amount of space that um, so many of these traditions come to when, when sort of debating um, their value. Um, these uh, oral traditions generated um, considerable debates among historians and anthropologists about their utility as sources of the past. Um, many oral traditional accounts can vary widely on basic facts about key figures and the sequence of critical events from one to another. And problems such as these have led some scholars to discount their value as sources of historical knowledge. Others have argued that the complete rejection of these sources is unwarranted and have proposed interpretive schema with which to distinguish the verifiable from the plausible and the important from the implausible, uh, which is the position that I have adopted. African oral and European written sources for the Sahel were created for distinct purposes, organized around divergent premises, and centered different audiences. They must be read differently but are not wholly incompatible. Limits imposed by available sources and certain conceptual frameworks, um, such as world systems, uh, Atlantic, or certain nationalist uh, approaches, have continued to pose significant challenges. 
especially for centering the historical experiences of non-elites and um, questions of relations across gender, ethnicity, and other forms of socially constructed difference within the region. This paper will discuss convergence, the convergence and dissonance across a range of sources for Bamana speaking Karta, um, which as you see is a region that was located um, at the intersection uh, between Trans-Saharan and Atlantic um, trading networks in the 17th and 18th century. And um, I just put a, a sort of square box around this zone here, um, which is of most uh, interest to me in this question. So I'm going to give three brief examples um, from these sources on Carta and Segu um, that I'm treating as fragments and layers of historical information and discourse that are embedded within larger narratives. Um, briefly, they are Coyote's narrative itself, which I'll um, describe very briefly. Um, then an oral account reported by a colonial administrator in the early 20th century, very early. And um, a final fragment reported by Anne Raphael in the 1850s. So the first example comes from Coyote's account and the way in which it reflects the overlapping histories of Islam in the Sahel with that of its mandang speaking populations of which the Bamana are but one part and regional landscapes of memory. Throughout his account of Karta, Kuyate intriguingly conflates important sites of the Muslim holy lands, such as Mecca, Medina, and Kaibar, with places of great historical significance within the inland Delta, the Delta region of Mali, um, such as Ja, which we saw reference to earlier, um, which was an ancient city uh, linked with uh, the Soninke Empire of Ghana. Kuyate begins by describing the ancestors of the Kula, Kulibali as three brothers identified as Simbong, an honorific given only to accomplished hunters in Mandang societies. These brothers were said to have fought as mercenaries at the Battle of Kaibara um, in a war near what became the colonial city of Kai. Uh, on the Senegal River, uh, approximately somewhere around here. They fought to advance an unspecified set of Muslim interests, but afterward insisted on their independence from set, said interests. Victorious in battle, these fighters are depicted as more interested in acquiring weapons um, than in praying. So um, we have a, I'll just have a brief quote here. When the country had been destroyed, the leader asked them if they wanted a place in paradise. This was not just any chief. This was the prophet. They had helped him in the battle of Kaibara. He said, do you not want a place in paradise? They replied, bobbing up and down all night, bobbing up and down all day to gain such a reward. We have no time for that. So the prophet said, very well, what would you like instead? We want powder and bullets, they said. Very well, they are yours, said the prophet, and good luck to you. Um, so this metaphorical allusion to a battle at Kaibara that took place near Kai evoked a parallel with the Battle of Kaibar led by the prophet Muhammad in the very his early history of Islam and seems to uh, locate this battle into a longer term historical teleology around the conversion to Islam which we understand uh, to have occurred in this region, um, not in a linear fashion, but um, as having many digressions over time, over time and space. Throughout his narration, Kuyate uh, sometimes expresses Bamana critiques of Muslims, um, while in other episodes, he portrays key figures, such as the mother of Bitan Kulibali, uh, the first ruler of Segu, her name was Sunu Sako, as uh, a devout Muslim. In this way, what emerges are less absolute claims, but a complex layering of references to Islam, individual Muslims, and to the personal characteristics of Sansan himself, which are thought to represent um, uh, sort of uh, pure Bamana values associated with agriculture. Um, but another thing about the, uh, this battle of uh, Kaibara uh, which I find striking, is that it is uh, also suggestive of 18th century conditions in and around market towns located between Bakel 
in eastern Senegal and Kai in western Mali, which were points of exchange between three major ecological zones. Uh, just to go back to the map again. And um, it was interesting in the talk earlier, uh, thinking about um, cities from earlier, earlier times that located in these ecological zones. And um, it'd be very interesting to try to think about where some of these places are, because there's, um, I'm sure, more uh, to be um, sort of documented than is currently um, talked about. Um, the area associated with Carta, as you see, is located just north of um, what are gold mines. Uh, here in this region at Bambouk. Um, and so um, this area brought together a lot of different interests into competition, um, where, uh, for example, Kassan and Maninka villagers faced annual raids um, from Karta. French and British merchants, uh, the French along this axis, the British along this axis, all um, sort of headed to this gold mine area tried to establish themselves there by trafficking an array of commercial goods, firearms, European woolens, varieties of dyed and woven cotton cloths from India, brass basins, mirrors, iron bars, glass and coral beads, among uh, other items. The European presence added to commercial activity um, in this region, but also to this um, already uh, somewhat intense uh, competition between varied interests. Seasonal caravan commerce in gold, captives, weapons, and other goods exchanged um, in this frontier, risked being delayed, taxed, or even seized in conflicts and raids and counter raids. So while there's not much detail one could map onto a specific time and place about this uh, Battle of Kaibara, um, Kuyate's account does meaningfully evoke a general context for that time and place that fits what we can be uh, gleaned from other sources, as well as introducing a perspective and rationale uh, of the people that he described. Um, so the next fragment I want to turn to um, concerns a pivotal conflict uh, between Segu and Karta, uh, between the Segu and Karta branches of the Kulibali clan. A number of oral traditional accounts collected in the early colonial period mention this conflict, but provide differing motives and accounts of what happened. Um, there are a few lines in the last section of a local Arabic script chronicle called Fragment of the Old Walata Chronicle um, that helped to establish a date for this conflict at 1754 um, or 1167 on Ohejira, but um, offers a few additional details. Um, an account recorded by a colonial administrator in 1904 claimed that um, the conflict uh, was an attack that was retribution from Bitan Kulibali of Segu, who was incensed that his distant cousin at Karta had preemptively married um, one of his daughters, Basana, who had been intended to be wed to someone else. Bitan responded by sending soldiers to attack the Kartan town of Sansana, named for Sanson Koulibaly, who I mentioned earlier, but which at that point was headed by a de one of his descendants, um, who was known as Masasi. Um, but the Segu soldiers were twice defeated there. Um, at this, Bitan was said to turn to local marabous for spiritual assistance in order to gain advantage over the town headed by his cousin, whose name was Fulakuru. Um, seven months passed before one marabou devised um, a plan. Finally, um, this is a quote from the source, one of them said, if someone were to give me a magnificent boo-boo, um, referring to the sort of long flowing gowns uh, of, worn by persons of status in the region, of a great chief, I will suffuse it with such qualities that when Fulukuro puts it on, the town of Sansana will be yours. Bitan bought a resplendent boo-boo, pricked it all over with a needle, and delivered it to the marabou. Once the incantation was completed, they called a jeweler trader who used to trade between Segu and Sansana and promised him payment of 100 captives if he was able to sell the garment to Fulukuro. 
So um, basically, in a, in a nutshell, this uh, ruse was said to have worked in this source. And Fulakoro was seduced by the extravagance and expense of the bubu shown to him by the trader, um, and also by the fact that few others could afford this garment. He purchased it, put it on, and soon fell unconscious from the effects of the substance that had been sewn into it. He awoke the next morning uh, to discover that while he was unconscious, Bitan's army had commenced a, an attack on the town. And so this way, the stronghold of Karta eventually fell to Segu, um, with most of the um, Masasi Kulabali clan killed and only a small number surviving to flee to other towns. So in thinking about this incident, um, there are um, varying uh, accounts of this attack and that I don't um, have time to sort of parse but, uh, or get into detail today. But um, what the description of this incident um, shows, uh, I think, is, is the intimate dynamic between elite Bamana figures at um, Segu um, with Soninke Muslims. Uh, who served Bitan as advisors, assistants, and fixers, and suggest a different perspective on relations between these groups from the uh, first example uh, mentioned a minute ago. Um, in this text, uh, which comes from a sort of series of interviews um, conducted by this uh, administrator, there is a subtext of tension um, a sort of negative assessment of Bamana Karta from the point of view of the Soninke Muslim um, sources um, that were recorded by Adam. This uh, tension is evident in the way the Marabus describe, um, decide to entrap uh, the Cartan leader by appealing to his vanity and greed. This characterization of Fulakoro um, and there's actually some interesting ambiguity in his name, so there's uh, sort of many levels to sort of peel back in thinking about this um, text, but the, his characterization accords with a licentiousness uh, attributed uh, to the cartons generally. Uh, their market at Sansana, for example, was said to be full of calabashes of dolo, which was a sort of um, millet-based intoxicating drink. Um, where, because people there had the custom of getting drunk, right? So beyond the sort of tensions implied by these um, sort of descriptions, uh, I think the episode also sort of brings forward the role of markets and the consumption of goods as a site of negotiation between these different constituencies and how um, each of them sought to advance their own agendas through the use of intermediaries. Okay, so the final fragment I wanted to discuss um, shifts focus to um, the, an account uh, recorded um, in the 1850s uh, by a French naval officer, Anne Raffinel, who was detained uh, for eight months in Carta. Uh, uh, Raffinel uh, wrote a, a history of Carta based on interviews that he uh, conducted also with local uh, jelly. Um, and embedded within this larger history um, is a brief uh, account of an 18th century life of the eldest son of Bitan Koulibaly, um, whose name was Dekoro. Uh, Dekoro became ruler of Segu when Bitan died in 1755, the year after the Sansano uh, attack um, that I talked about a second ago. Um, as a fragment within this larger text, this account is remarkable for the detailed snapshot it contains of the material life and uh, statecraft at Segu, which was premised on an economy of slaving, uh, but also um, it also speaks of a revolt of the enslaved that, not for the first or last time, saw a formerly enslaved person um, installed as uh, the ruler of Segu. So according to this source, after his father died, Dekoro wanted to distinguish himself from his predecessors and peers. He decided to have a wall constructed around the town of Segu in order that it be ritually reinforced with the bodies of 60 slaves who were to be buried in the wall's foundation, supposedly making the walls impossible to breach. Because holding enslaved people signified wealth, 
the public sacrifice of so many was meant to obviously demonstrate both his wealth and immense power, um, as well as to instill fear and uh, submission in uh, other subjects. On the appointed day, Decoro had each captive, both male and female, dressed in six lengths of fine cloth, as if for a festive occasion. They were forced to stand next to trenches around the town's perimeter, where they were blindfolded and slaughtered, uh, their bodies dumped into trenches. Um, I've not been able to find corroboration of this uh, sort of gruesome historical fragment in other written or archaeological sources. Um, although oral accounts for another city, the other city of Jenne, um, do mention a similar incident where an autochthonous girl was said to have been buried in a wall um, to protect the town and to guarantee its prosperity. Nevertheless, this fragment offered unusual sartorial details. Decoro himself was said to arrive at this public event, announced by praise singers, along with the music of a balafon, local xylophone wooden, drums, a flute, silver bells, um, and riding a white horse whose body was adorned with Grigri amulets. And I thought of this earlier today um, at the exhibit when we saw the uh, example of the textile in Egypt that had the Arabic script in the textile. Um, and so this idea of these Greek amulets, which would contain um, sections of the Quran or some sort of prayer, um, the idea that these provided um, protection, it just struck me as I was striking to see the similarity there. Um, he wore a hunter's cap that had been worn in earlier campaigns and a loose tunic, or jaloki in local terms, that was made of blue silk embroidered with gold threads and also crisscrossed with more protective amulets. He carried a musket um, inlaid with gold. These details showed evidence of his privileged connection to long distance markets where muskets, gunpowder, as well as a variety of imported and local cloths would have been available. And the way such goods became imbricated into uh, a public performance of state power and ritual authority. The captive's murder would not go unanswered, however, as it provoked a revolt among other slaves. A group of them were said to have ambushed Decoro the next evening after he'd, been, after he'd given his clothes to an attendant to take a bath. The captives reportedly tortured and killed the royal, um, trafficked his wife and children into slavery, um, and installed someone from among their ranks, um, as I said earlier, as um, ruler of Segu. Um, and so just to sort of wrap up this, this last fragment, there is a separate account um, recorded um, at another time that uh, adds an interesting detail, which was that um, one of the captives actually strangled Decoro to death um, with a strip of cotton cloth, um, an implausibly neat, though fitting rejoinder to what had been uh, the cruel project that he'd orchestrated. So uh, to wrap up, uh, what I wanted to sort of conclude here with is that um, for many historians of the 18th century, um, the Karta and Sego regions um, come into the discussion as a source of persons trafficked into Atlantic slavery, and thus um, primarily as a peripheral region to the Atlantic um, before it re-enters um, historiography around um, Islamic jihads, uh, such as the one of uh, El Hajj Umar, and French colonialism later in the 19th century. Um, for me, thinking about this earlier period um, moves us beyond uh, a narrow fit focus on um, European African dynamics on the coast as the only story of the 18th century for this region. It centers the Sahel to emphasize continuities between um, the earlier periods, even the medieval period, uh, if you want to use that term, um, to the Atlantic area, uh, the Atlantic era, and later periods. Uh, the sources for Carta, uh, however, uh, make it difficult to um, reconstruct um, detailed accounts of daily life 
during what, um, by many accounts, is this apogee in this 18th century period. Paying attention, uh, however, to fragments, layers, and silences within these sources, as well as to their distinct preoccupations, biases, and modes of communication yields um, significant insight. They illuminate the complexity and contingency of these earlier contexts for um, both these polities that were um, heavily reliant on mercenary warfare in an economy premised on slaveholding that changed over time. Um, they reveal distinct points of view, changing social relationships and connections outside the region itself that otherwise get glossed over um, and that provide, a, uh, I think, a vital basis for comparison um, to other parts of the region, other parts of the world. Um, on the other hand, um, both um, external and internal sources for this period share a similar lack of sustained interest in women, non-elites, um, and populations otherwise marginal to the producers of these sources. Um, and so uh, these are obviously um, some of the questions and issues that I think about a lot, and I uh, would love to um, discuss with you further. So uh, thank you.